Welcome to the Happy Pair Podcast, where our ultimate goal is to inspire, educate, and awaken your curiosity, and overall, to help you to become healthier and happier. We're Dave and Steve, identical twins who started a veg shop nearly 20 years ago. Since then, it's expanded into a social following of over one and a half million people, nearly 50 million views of our videos, nearly half a million books sold, cafes, farms, apps, courses, food products to help you to eat more veg. We speak to thought leaders, health experts, trailblazers and specialists of all kinds, from the ones you know to those you've never, ever heard of. Come, Power. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for making the trip down, genuinely. Really lovely to have you here and uh, spend time. Coleman's a legend. He really, really is. You've arrived down at the farm a number of times and with this, you're a ball of energy and light and laugh and hugs. And uh, yeah, it's just great to be here and chat and get under the skin a little bit with the great Coleman power. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. No, it would mean major pleasure to be here with you two guys. And uh, yeah, I have a whole lot of energy, but that's down to the foods and the lifestyle that I currently well, certainly live on a daily basis from AM to PM. Yeah, like, like that's one of the one things which I kind of go, like your attitude to life is beautiful. Like it really, really is. It's like a young puppy dog on Christmas Eve. Like you're, you're like a young kid you know, on Christmas Eve with Santa coming and like this. That, like I loved, like we did a podcast recently with Zach Bush and he finished with kind of saying like how if you're a parent, if you can see the world the way your child sees it and ensure your child doesn't see the world the way you see it, that was progress. <laughs> so I think to, to talk about that, how you have this wonderful childlike awe and wonder and exuberance about the world. So I think I'd love to get into the mindset and go, well, what, 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 is the, what are the building blocks that create this mindset? And it probably is food and lifestyle and movement and whatever, but I'd love to... But underneath it, there's a curiosity. Yeah, well, certainly. I suppose the idea that I would have started off being someone who wasn't maybe as popular as I am now today. The point is that I would have struggled in school, didn't have a huge amount of friends and would have definitely struggled with the women. And people were like, oh my God, Colin, what? I'm like, yeah, struggled big time. Probably still do at the age of 32. A uh, single man. And he's a hunk just for anyone who hasn't seen the visual. You want to see him? <laughs> you, so you said he single man. He, he, he came into the beach the other day and he was just standing there with his top on and then he whips off his pants and he's got this real tight pair of budgie smuggers, you know, that left nothing to the imagination. Took off his top and the hunk went into the sea and wow, he looks magnificent. Oh, a bit of a show from uh, well, Baywatch as they walked in and out with the boys. Yeah, you look great. Yeah, no, I, 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 but what that's kind of what started me off, I suppose, being the younger version of myself being unconfident, being weak and not being able to get on the sports teams and was really looking to be the best version of myself. And it all started with then, I suppose, what social media would have been out then. Was it Facebook at the time, maybe? Um, even before it was like Bebo, where you saw kind of people that were interested in improving their health and what they were doing was eating chicken, broccoli and rice. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Do some push-ups, was doing push-ups, doing sit-ups. And was this with a desire to be kind of better, just to feel more... Yeah, to be more confident, more, massively then. Okay, and then confident. Okay. Yeah, build on that then when you start to see progress in the way your body composition, you start to see a little bit of muscle, you kind of go, yeah, I feel more confident, I feel happier, I feel healthier. And then this was, that's where the initial spark was kind of started. And then I went on from there and studied horticulture. And then that was literally this was the catalyst of you can grow your own foods and that's where I kind so, of started. So horticulture being the kind of study of how to grow stuff. Yes. Isn't that? Yeah. yeah plants also. really. How to grow plants. Yeah. And then I remember the option was in college. It was like, oh man, do you want to do more plants or do you want to do more fruits and vegetables? And the point was kind of the, we'd be looking after them the same amount of time, but the trees and the plants you didn't get to eat. And then the fruits and the vegetables you did get to eat. So I was like, I think I'm going with option B. So I went and studied uh, plants, uh, more, so, more so fruits and vegetables, as opposed to like the plants and trees and on top of that. Wow. So, so it, was, it was a proper study of like, so you are an expert gardener and farmer. To uh, and I'm going to tell you, I, I am now, I suppose you put me as an expert, but through college, I learned very little. You know what I mean? You r- learn off something black and white, write it down on another piece of paper to get a piece of paper. That was the majority of my college. I really should have been more hands on. And until I came out of college, until I put, I put my hands into the soil and started sowing the seeds, you really start to uh, learn by, I learn by doing, I'm dyslexic by trade. And again, that was another thing that was against me. And that's one of the things that I suppose drove me on because I wasn't the best in school, because I wasn't the strongest, because I wasn't the tallest or I couldn't get on the sports teams. Um, and everybody, that gives you a bit of a grit and that can you a push to do more than other people were actually 
doing like so that's what really got me supposed to where I am here today recording the podcast yeah, and well, then in terms you arrived you arrived here today and put, sticking your hands in your pockets and I was admiring your shorts and I was saying beautiful shorts Colm and they, you look the real deal like they're real kind of like builder man shorts uh, and, and you stick your hand in your pockets and you pull out packets half open packets of cucumber seeds and half open packets of sweet corn seeds and it's like jeez the, you're the real deal Colm and you've been planting vegetables like today this morning I've been up since 6 o'clock this morning so I'd they come and for someone to ask me, Coleman, what do you do? I do goddamn everything. I get up before the sun. I'm most certainly contacting people. I'm training, mentoring and coaching online through foods, nutrition, exercise, send them those messages before they even get up. After that, then I'm going out. I'm grounding myself. I'm doing some light exercise, stretching, mobility. And after that, then I'm going sowing some seeds that then literally feed people and show them through social media, video clips, how to do it themselves. Because uh, that's my whole emphasis. It's a lifestyle thing. And then I come back in there for breakfast. Um, I do a typical type of, I suppose, intermittent fasting, but I don't really call it that. It's just the time that I take my break and have my first meal at. And that's What the, time do you have your break yet? Around 10 o'clock, typically. Ah, like lovely. Yeah. With a cup of tea, like? I would. I'd even maybe dandelion tea. Oh, yeah. oh, lovely. Dandelion tea. Nettle, sure. Nettle is the season now. Would too. you believe for breakfast? I was on to be father after. And he was like, what did you have for breakfast? Oh, I had uh, savoury porridge. What you put in it? Nettles. I should my granddad used to do that. I was like, Fair. go on. You, you put nettles in your porridge? Nettles today. in my porridge this morning. They contain iron, vitamin C and magnesium and they're a natural antihistamine. So those are actually th- something for people that suffer with hay fever. And I used to suffer with these things and I all, all, again, this is how I, I learned to, I suppose, my topics of nutrition. I literally was like, how do I reduce my hay fever? I used to be rubbing my nose redder than Rudolph there at some stages. And after that then, adding in, incorporating in the likes of nettles into my diet, wild garlic, all natural antihistamines. Wow, that's a really yeah, interesting then we'll, one. We'll pick nettles. Uh, like we all have nettle tea most evening uh, and for anyone listening who wants to know how to pick a nettle normally you know lots of people say there's a kind of old I guess fairy tale myths that if you hold your breath and you pick it you won't get stung it doesn't work put on a glove yeah it works but if you want to look really cool and impress someone go under the leaf and the kind of the, the stingers kind of point outward so if you go from the stalk into the leaf and pull it towards you you don't get stung there you are. That's the trick. So, so how did you have nettles in your porridge? Do you just like Steam eat them down. whole like a real hard man, <laughs> or do you, or do you just rub them across it? your chest first and then just straighten them out? Or how do you, how do you? You can't eat them raw, and I've only done it very, very I recently because someone kind of sometimes do. We'll fold yeah, them up you and fold eat them, them up yeah, and yeah, then yeah. put them in. But what I, I typically do is use them like spinach. Just literally grab them, fresh nettles, spring nettles they call them, in from the garden, just anywhere at all. Take them off in, the stalk. Take them straight off the stalk. Typically the first couple of inches are the most nutritious, like any root or vegetable or salad leaves. Bring them in, mix them in with the porridge, organic oats, bish bash bash, then have a protein source with it then and you're absolutely laughing for a balanced meal. Sucking diesel. The nice. multivitamin. And then uh, to go back to the issue with confidence, because loads of people listen and might go, geez, yeah, I struggle with confidence. Like, h- how did you kind of, uh, is it something that you kind of, have to consciously work on on a day to day basis, or is it something that now you've found found a sense a profession of profession that gives you a sense of purpose. Do you feel much more confidence within your own niche? And for anyone listening who's kind of going, yeah, I've, I've struggled with confidence. What 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 kind of has really helped you? Was it about finding your niche? Or well, confidence isn't something you're born with because I sure as hell wasn't as confident as I am here today, standing listening recording this podcast with you. So the idea is. I was certainly built on it and it definitely come, comes through the fact that how you present yourself. So the way I suppose I currently look now helps. I'm strong and I tell myself this in the morning through the likes of affirmations. I'm strong, I'm tall, I'm a confident entrepreneur. I have a best-selling book that I sell at my public speaking events. I help people through all throughout their lives through health, nutrition and most certainly either growing or buying their own organic produce. That's roughly a line that I say every single morning and I've said that for the last five years. And now I have a book that I'm most certainly in my back pocket. But again, it didn't happen overnight. The book took two and a half years to write. And it was extremely difficult for someone like myself to even sit down or even like sitting down. Even now I'm kind of moving and twitching the whole time. I literally am bred to move. Like we're lucky enough to actually do a couple of pull-ups um, before we came in here, which is absolutely great because obviously it took me a period of time, an hour to get here in the car. And uh, yeah, I love moving and it's something that brings me major joy. And after you start to see your body change you build in confidence so yeah you build all the time yeah baby steps towards confidence because it's not something yeah and I, th- I think 
the more you find your niche, it gives you more edge with which to be confident in your little space. Like almost like we're all animals and you find your little your little patch where you have control over and suddenly it's like anyone who steps on your patch is like, yeah, this is my patch. I know it. I feel more confident. So yeah. Goal setting sense. was a massive thing that I suppose helped me as well. Like a lot of people are unsure of what to do in a day. And as a result of that, they'll just literally float around and they might be successful at one thing. They might get a raise. They might find a partner. They might find a house that they will live in for the rest of their lives. But if you're really specific on something that you want, you should write it down. Writing it down gets you clear from where you are to where you want to be. And as a realization of that, I was lucky enough to come across mentors uh, that helped me both in growing and in business and in, I suppose, physical appearance and training, personal training. Those are things that I would highly recommend to people. It doesn't have to be paid. There's loads of free content online from mentors that you can literally gain the advantage of for minimal cost. And as a result of that, you would literally get to where you would like to be a little bit faster, which again is that point of building on your confidence. And is that almost like what you're saying about like manifesting or kind of like, like manifesting is a word that sometimes tarnished. Some people love it. Other people go, oh, I don't like it. You know, it, it kind of rubs me up the wrong way or whatever. But ultimately it's about whether you call it setting goals or whether you vision the future or planning. You know, business people might call it strategy. This is our strategy. Whereas other, someone else might call it manifesting. And ultimately it's having a vision for the future and kind of consistently focusing on it and working out a plan of steps to take you to get the, maybe the manifesting bit doesn't imply the plan bit but I wondered is that something which you kind of like when you're talking about writing it down is it is it more elaborate than that do you work at a plan or is it kind of more esoteric where you sit there and go right I want to write a best selling book I want to have abs I want to teach people how to grow loads of vegetables and I want to become much happier and healthier myself is that is that kind of or, or I would break it down to different sections because life isn't just one way it isn't just get yourself into the best condi physical condition you can it's more explosive up in your health your wealth your love your fulfillment you can break it up into as many different sections as you like but that's important that you have those different sections and you have a specific goal for them and then from that I lined out what I wanted to do who I wanted to help I wanted to make people happier and healthier and that comes from every single food item that you have for breakfast lunch or dinner yeah, food is, I think, the building blocks of so much of health. Like, and I, I, one thing that really, I really admire in your message is this emphasis on organic. And for many people, many people don't even know what organic means. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe, let's, start maybe let's start at, at ground zero, literally in the, the deep soil, down with the earthworms. What is organic and why should people eat organic? The idea of organic is actually a registered term. So the point is that if my mom or dad were growing at home, they actually really can't say the word, uh, it's organic. So that's the first word and point. The point in on top of that then is that why do I want people to eat more organic? It's what's not in it as opposed to what's actually in it. That'll be the main point. There's higher antioxidants, but some people will argue that there's no difference. The point is that harsh chemicals are not used, such as glyphosate. Glyphosate is one of those things that is, has been proven to be a carcinogenic. That's something you don't want in your diet in any amount. The best way you can possibly do that is either go to a country market or go to somewhere that you know that is chemical free. And or if you still can't afford that, it's growing your own, which is a massive, massive advantage. And if anyone doesn't have the price of a packet of seeds, I will give them two euro to buy their own packet of seeds. And everybody, I will then teach them how to save their seeds and they will actually make money from that because you can sell then those chemical free organic produce or seeds to your friends, your family members or anyone that wants to do their own growing as well. And do, do you find that like, you know, you being in the horticulture game, do you find that people that aren't growing organic, everyone else is spraying herbicides, pesticides, fungicides and, you know, chemical farming. Is that just the norm if you are, if someone is not typically growing organically? Well, you can obviously find people, large commercial farms that would be spraying on a heavily percentage. But what I'm trying to do is educate the, I suppose, the family, the people that literally want the best type of produce at their back garden, at their back porch, in a poly, sort of in a glass house, because that, again, is shortening the learning curve, the effort that they have to go anywhere to get the food, because the easier it is for people to get their hands on the chemical free organic produce the better it is because food is medicine it's one of those things as soon as you taste it you go oh my god anybody that has literally ever tasted i'm going to say a homegrown tomato 
Taste is amazing. That's linked with antioxidants. Antioxidants have so many different benefits. They're literally able to reduce stress. When you have less stress, you have more energy. And that's one of the reasons why I have, well, one of the many reasons why I have a lot of energy. Like it's true, the foods, like it doesn't have to be, God, Corbin, you're a million miles away from me. Nettles, like you don't have to eat nettles. You eat spinach, which are, I suppose, bread similar from the likes of the leafy greens that are grown wild in the in the hedgerows the point is you get any type of green in your diet add in a purple kale add in the likes of a purple cabbage add in those tomatoes add in apples and that's be one of my major goals as well uh, for the next I suppose couple of years to try and get as many people and schools involved in having an apple tree for each class and as a result of that then every single year the flowers will be in April when the children are in school after that in September every child throughout the growing season will have a chemical free apple that they can literally pick up which is a natural literally prebiotic which is good for your gut health which is a natural mood improver 90% of your serotonin producing your gut all these things are literally within arm's reach of people and I want more schools to get involved in that yeah, yeah. Totally. In, in, in essence with, with uh, organic it's largely to focus on soil health and typically before you grow food you grow soil which sounds weird and anyone listening going oh, why would it grow soil but in essence all m- vitamins and minerals or all minerals largely will come from soil uh, and the more biodiverse your soil is, the more biodiverse your, or more resilient your food is going to be. And ultimately an antioxidant is, am I right in saying that an antioxidant, it comes from the plant ha- having the ability to defend itself. And when there's no herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, or, you know, various different biological killers, um, the plant has to learn to have more defense mechanisms. So when you eat it, you're ingesting these antioxidants. Yeah, greater yeah. amount to them. And you gain the benefits of exactly of those antioxidants. And why, the reason why, I suppose those plants most certainly have higher antioxidants. Take the example of a tomato. So we have the green fly that bites on the tomato leaf that we typically don't eat, but then the antioxidants are produced and they go into the fruits. We then end are the end consumers of those fruits and gain the advantage of lycopene and tomatoes actually have the benefit for coming into season for a reason. They're actually able to naturally protect the skin from sunlight. It's not that I actually recommend people get sunburned, but it protects them and is one of those things that comes into season for a reason. There's different fruits and vegetables coming in to the winter months. They're high in fibre, a particular type of fibre called inulin. You have the likes of garlic, onion, leeks, Jerusalem artichokes. If anyone hasn't ever heard of them. Yeah, fartichoke. The fartichoke also commonly known as, yeah, I was going to say. From the sunflower family. Yeah, it most certainly is. And that's, it's it's literally one of those superfoods that I do recommend for people to literally try, but slow and steady with those because they're dangerous weapons. They're windy. (laughs) They're windy. 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 Don't be eating them if you're going on a date. Spend time outside afterwards. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, major advantage. Uh, so Jerusalem artichoke is the root veg that kind of grows, it spreads by... Uh, it's a tuber. It's a tuber that kind of spreads, it ke- keeps... What do you call it? It's a, Is it a tuber? It's yeah, it a, is a tuber, an edible yeah. tuber. And yeah. literally it's similar to a potato, grows underneath the ground. And as a result of that, if we only knew that way back in the famine, it actually doesn't get blight. So it's just a no-brainer for people who are worried about, oh, God, man, how do I grow uh, potatoes without getting the likes of blight? Well, you could grow blight-resistant varieties. That's the first thing. Or you grow earlier varieties that don't have the issue with the uh, symptoms of uh, the high humidity, typically in August and September with the cold and the wet and the most certainly humidity from the high temperatures that we can get. So there's one thing. The and high temperatures. What country are you living in? I'm a water from man. But but uh, Jerusalem artichoke, it's a starchy root veg, so it's kind of like a potato, but it's got more a celery. It's got a love, and it's got a kind of almost like nutty like taste. I think they're wonderful, wonderful in stews, wonderful kind of braised or seared. And I think, but they're, they're not like you know the way you used to buy a ten kilo bag of spuds. You'd never see someone buying 10 kilos of Jerusalem artichokes because you put a kilo people might it's not a commonly grown veg I, I don't know it's just not a commonly like and we're saying this as people with a veg shop yeah you know, no it wouldn't be that common because a lot of people don't know about it and if people don't know about it the point is they're not going to willing to risk and try things just at random and that's another thing that I and how I got into actually different fruits and vegetables so I did a bit of traveling I've been to Australia I've been to America and obviously did a stop off in Thailand but when I went over to Australia I didn't know how to cook and, and now I cook every day for myself, quick, healthy meals. But when I went to uh, Australia, um, we were based in Perth and there was this country market, big, massive signs and there were stalls all around the place. And I was like, this place looks amazing. They had really live music. And I was like, oh, I love this. And a fellow went in and was like, they have them all over Ireland. And I was like, really? Yeah. And I'm from the country. I would have never really been someone who had went to country markets up to that. I was 24 going to Australia. Went in and there was a wild list of fruits and there was things that I'd never seen before. And I was like, oh my God, what's this? And he said, uh, 
it's asparagus. I grew, I grew up and was like, oh my God, asparagus. Literally, my, my mother and what father. What do you do with it? Yeah, I was like, what, what do I do? He's like, oh, you lightly steam and stir fry that. It's beautiful. And he was just like, it has all types of benefits. And I was like, what kind of benefits? Improve blood flow. And I was like, what kind of blood flow? To all areas of the body. To all extremities. And I was like, give me a bunch of them quick. So I literally bought a load of them, went back home, chopped them up, stir fry, bish, bash, bash, threw in a, uh, I don't know, lentils, I think was one of the meals I had with it. Unreal, pink Himalayan salt, natural electrolytes, game changer. Yeah, I can vouch for us. delighted. <laughs> oh, they were a dream. They were, un- they were unbelievable. And uh, yeah, again, major benefits. They most certainly have B, they have A, they have vitamin C. And I love eating foods that literally give you exactly what you're looking for, your body needs. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of the a really lovely angle on your message is that many people see organic as this elitist thing and something that you need to be kind of wealthy or a higher earner to be able to afford organic or you need to be sick whereas your message is about the importance of eating organic but getting your hands in the soil and actually growing some of your own food so I wonder if we could talk about like the importance why why growing your own food because like I I remember even my wife's Polish like when we go to Poland pretty much everyone's garden they're growing their own food when I go to rural Spain up the north of it they all have little huertitos where they're all growing there everyone just has it and similarly you know back 30 years ago we all grew our own food and we were connected to our food source and we knew what it looked like whereas nowadays you buy it in the shop and you buy asparagus all year round from Peru yeah, it's literally madness, really, when you think about it. We've come so far away from where food is actually grown. And I'm trying to get as many people as I possibly can to grow their own food. The point is that we should be eating in season. And that's the point that when you do grow your own food, it's not just the benefits of the vitamins, the minerals. You're outside. There's vitamin D. There's that grounding connection that I do with either your bare feet, your hands touching the soil. There's your mental health. There's your physical health. All incorporated in as soon as you start to do the simple things. What we were doing, as I said, my grandfather was doing. It was a generation where we skipped it. We wanted to go faster. We wanted to go quicker. We wanted things handed to us. We were doing the drive through And now we don't even do the drive through anymore. We literally go from, can I get it delivered to my door? You open the door, come straight from the couch to the door, answer, hand them over the money, pop down back on the seat. And that's it. We're skipping too many stages. And then we're wondering why we're lethargic, why we, ha- we have poor health, why we're overweight, why we have poor skin. Because we're not doing the simple things. So a seed today to gain the advantage in the future. Yeah, there's something metaphorical about out there sowing seeds and like, like and we know it because th- we started the farm last year and we've nearly had a full calendar year in it and having a vegetable shop was one thing. You know, we've had a veg shop for nearly 20 years and, you know, we'd appreciate veg and we learned how to cook them and learned how to process them and learned good veg and bad veg and really understood and dealt with loads of farmers and all this type of stuff. But it's not until this year when we've really had our hands in the soil that we've realised, like, there's such a process in terms of getting food because most of us are so detached. You go to the supermarket, oh, I don't really like those carrots. Oh, they don't look good, you know, or they don't like those onions. Whereas when you've been involved in the growing process, there's just so much energy and time and aspects that grow into the fruit or vegetable, like there really is. And it's so much more than the nutrients that are in it because, you know, as, as like there's Stephen up there, like, to you know, yesterday we got a whole lot of trees delivered to, to, to plant out to protect the tunnels from the wind. And there's, there's getting the soil right and sowing the seeds. And there's, there's, there's months worth of process that goes into the, and it's really the fruit of this labour, like is the produce. It's one of those things that when you start to grow your own, the appreciation of food just goes through the roof. You grow a carrot or a parsnip and it started to fork, you're like, oh my God, I've literally looked after this, I've watered it, I've weeded it, I'm going to eat it any which way it is. And I wouldn't even recommend people actually to peel the carrots or the parsnips because most of the beneficial antioxidants are actually located either in the skin or just below it. Why do you need to peel it? Just wash off the dirt. Even if you don't want to wash off the dirt, there's actually Brush serotonin in the dirt. Take a bite of it. Bugs Bunny, onto a winner. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's a nice one. And the same with tomatoes. Like the idea that some people, like even my own family members, they wouldn't even know when they're sown. They're sown in Ireland in February. I saw mine on Valentine's Day because I absolutely love tomatoes. Oh. All right. Sown the tomatoes on Valentine's Day. And you, you'll obviously have them somewhere warm so they're germinating. And germinating they're with either a warm windowsill if you're doing them at home or on a heated bench if you have the advantage of that. And then you're literally minding them like a child. Do you play love music when you're planting them on Valentine's <laughs> Day? Because yeah. there is research, like, remember oh, Zach no, yeah. talking about research that literally a plant, but they put it, they put the little electrodes on it electrodes that measure on it. the measure aspects of it and they can play them certain music. And or even intention of thoughts, thoughts 
thoughts of love and thoughts of dislike or, or hate towards the plant and you could feel it and the plant's ability to grow or not grow. And there's something else I want to touch on as well, just about um, tickling or, yeah, tickling, we call tickling plants. I'll touch on that in a second. So when you sow your tomato seeds, most well, certainly in February, you water them, you transplant them, you then put them into the soil, you're looking after them, you're training them up a string line, you literally side shoot it. Again, that's February, March, April, May, June, July. You do not get Irish tomatoes, organic Irish tomatoes until the likes of six, six months later. Sowing a seed and then the idea is as soon as you taste it, the difference is amazing. And people are like, oh my God, this is actually what a tomato tastes like. I used to even like tomatoes growing up. I used to because I was eating the things that were in shops selling uh, fruits and vegetables for 49 cents, which are completely different. And they're not solving the problem. More people need to either support someone local, either a country market or a shop that has Irish produce in season. And it's hard most certainly to make money just off vegetables alone. So if you ever do see a fresh salad bag that's mixed with all different types of greens, currently in season right now, you're going from your brassicas, uh, oriental salads, that's your minsuna, your rockets, maybe some of your winter porcelain to leafy greens, lala rasa. You can have baby rainbow leaf, uh, chard in there. You can have baby beetroot in there. And all those things are growing in with season and they're literally high in water and that's another reason to eat in season we are looking at warmer warmer temperatures coming into the summer months this is something that's going to hydrate you improve your skin health and you literally improve your gut health and that's one of the things that is major linked with improved skin health because that's the largest organ in your body your skin and it's got a bacterial component to the same as your gut there's a microbiome on your skin as well to some degree yeah, there is, yeah. And that's why yeah. the benefits of whenever I would do, like even this morning, so I would have had my T-shirt off, not just to show off the abs or the muscles. I was outside on my own. <laughs> the point was... Just in case someone was watching from the ditch, like... <laughs> <laughs> you want to be looking in a good bit. I mean, off the road a long while. But uh, the point is, you gain advantage to the likes of the wind and your beneficial microorganisms is something that and you want a diversity of through the wind through the sun and through the likes of the soil and the compost that I'm currently using to sow the seeds those are one of the reasons that I literally am as healthy as I am here today but it's amazing now nowadays like you know the average person lives in a city you know that's statistically there's more of us live in cities than we do in urban environments now most of us spend a lot of our hours indoors on screens you know crunched over a laptop or a desk or whatnot that's a lot of the you know how we work nowadays then we go home and we sit in house you know so it's a very urban environment whereas what you're talking about is getting outside feeling the elements in our skin feeling it on our like literally on our skin you know the sun the wind the elements getting our hands in the soil like really basic things that really ultimately like you are you are really such an example of someone with a, a beautiful attitude like you really do you've got an incredible attitude and zest for life and I definitely like my perspective would be that a huge component of this is down to how you live your life you, you spend loads of time outdoors you're moving your hands are in the soil you're dealing with produce and the people around you you've got a mission you've got a message and this kind of ultimately leads and, and to there's, there's almost like an inbuilt patience required like as you said there it takes six months from when you plant your tomato seed till you harvest it and you got to nurture it and you got to kind of take the side shoots off and as you said train it to go up its little wire or its cable or whatever you want to call it um, so, so there's a certain embed patience and there's no uh, as you said often so many of us are looking for the hack like you said your grandparent your grandfather typically he had to do all the steps of it, whereas nowadays you can just ring whatever it is and deliver to your door pay the cash sit down have your meal whereas going through that process of sowing the seed germinating the seed harvesting it cooking it sitting eating it there's such an embed patience and appreciations and as a result there's this connection to the land and and maybe maybe because we've taken a lot of the steps out of the puzzle nowadays and we've we've kind of got you know as a society as one organism we've taken away the steps to make it easier supposedly easier for us that I can call up some takeaway and I get a dinner delivered to me but by taking a bit a lot of those processes maybe I'm missing out a lot of the value of it it's a bit like you know getting a degree without putting the work in you know you might have missed out the journey the journey ultimately maybe as the destination rather than the actual destination. We're gone philosophical here. Majorly. We've Majorly, yeah. a mindset here. Yeah, between yeah. Mind, the everything's mindset, mindset, isn't it? remember Right Livelihood. I remember reading that book. The, sorry, I'm talking too much here, but remember that, I read that book, one of my favourite books was called Small is Beautiful Small is by Beautiful, Schumacher. Yeah, Schumacher. And there was a chapter called Right Livelihood and it. it was about how in kind of Bhutan or countries like this, 
they only employed people to do jobs where they could, rather than doing like a single task, say Ford Model T, they created the factory line and one person put on that bolt all day long and that's all they did. Whereas in Bhutan, their approach to work was you want someone to see the start and the finish and to see all the parts so they had that beautiful sense of completion. And I think similarly with you, the way your approach to farming is you're seeing all the process and when you taste the food, there's this wonderful in, inbuilt appreciation. And I wonder what modern day society with all our you know, efficiencies, are we losing that? Yeah, and there's another point there on the likes of, it's the first part of the digestion process, actually harvesting it, then bringing it into the kitchen, chopping it up. We skip those stages and wondering why we've poor gut health. Again, gut health is massively important. You guys would most certainly have different top or individuals coming on talking about the gut health but we miss that stage the smell of the tomatoes the smell of fresh greens as soon as you open a bag of I suppose produce that you literally taken in from your polytunnel from your raised beds it's just a, 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 what would the word be aromatic it's the basil as soon as you pick a basil a, a leaf and the tomato you bring it in you're making your sauce together it's just one of those things that starts the digestion process that improves then the digestion which again is something that's going to reduce stress on the body so, so what are some of the easiest veg for anyone listening that goes right I'm inspired this, I'm inspired I'm curious I, I'm at home I'm, I'm, up, I'm up for this so what would you recommend to be something for someone to start that would be easy that's an easy win like Easy wins. There's loads of them. I definitely would start with courgettes. But one of the things that people do with courgettes is they buy one packet of courgette seeds and there's 10 in it. They'll sow all the 10 at the same time. And for anyone who literally listening right now and has ever sown courgettes and you grow more than one courgette plant, you will be able to feed not only your family, your neighbours, your neighbours' neighbours, your neighbours' cousins' neighbours. And it's just something that you only need really one. Because yeah, there's yeah. only so many courgettes there's you can so have. And the flowers, like courgettes, are just abundant and they just keep reproducing. You're like, oh my God. You can have a courgette plant that is feet long. And actually in terms of um, describing it, it's actually a marrow when it gets that big. But courgettes are a no-brainer. Starting off with tomatoes and make every failure along the way. Forget to side shoot it. Just leave it go wild and you'll have some tomatoes growing along the floor and you're not really sure. But from that, literally, it's a learning process. Oh my God, yeah, now I know what to have. Coleman was mentioning side shoots. I take those off and I can train it up either a bamboo stick or literally a wire or anything else for that matter. So tomatoes are a no-brainer. Kale is an absolute classic. I don't recommend broccoli or cauliflower because there's only one main head off that and as a result of that, you're waiting too long for it. Kale get multiple harvests for the same amount of space in, and they can be grown most certainly in the likes of a pot, raised bed, and that's something that I definitely recommend. And one of the most nutritious foods, pound per pound, you uh, can get. And easy to incorporate for pestos, for pastas. Like, it really is an easy one. And it is, it is in terms of, the, I'm sure you're all very aware of the nutrient density aggregate index. Oh, yes, I love um, that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, well, it's just, a, it's a, 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 kale is number one on that, which is the an index of all the healthiest foods from the healthiest to the least healthy kale is number one. So I love that. And even I'm sure maybe that's where we listed on that. Purple kale will be even higher because of those antioxidants would be of a, uh, Increased value because purple being a darker color, the darker more color. like Cavallo Nero or yeah, kind of yeah. Russian no, no, color. purple kale. Yeah, you know the purple. You know we you can get a red a red farm. Russian okay, is yeah. one of yeah, the red varieties Russian, you can yeah, get. Okay, yeah. I might even have the back of the seeds in my pocket if I actually went down deep enough in it. But uh, yeah, red Russian kale. Get your hands on those because yeah, that's a color that we don't typically eat in our diet. And if I ask most people to think of uh, something, a fruit or a vegetable that we currently eat that's purple. So the audience are going to go three, two, one. Most people Plum. blue or blueberries, Plum. yeah, which is a fruit, Fig. right? Mm. And they typically go only have a small period of time throughout the growing season that we'd have them. Kale can literally be harvested nearly 365 days a year. It's so resilient. Yeah. And you're gaining that advantage of that antioxidant anthrocyanin, which is able to improve your cognitive function. And it's definitely something that I've incorporated in a hell of a lot more and why I think a lot of it clearer as a result of eating and improving my diet. Mm. Kale, it's only now that kale's actually gone to seed, like on the farm. I was picking it last Saturday, was pulling the kale plants because, you know, it's gone to seed. So they'll start planting it. I'm sure we'll get it again in a few weeks. But yeah, kale, kale I think, is one of the best pound for pound because it, uh, you could just keep side shooting it. You keep just p- picking a few leaves off it and it just keeps growing and all year long. Like it really is. It's like cut and come again. And lettuce is the same and rocket are the same in that you, you plant it and you can keep just picking a, f- a number of leaves and it keeps growing and growing. But kale doesn't go to seed until spring really. And you, you plant yeah, it. Yeah, because it's typically part of, it's part of the brassica family. And typically like it's a cousin to 
cauliflower, broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And when the Brussels sprouts come in the season, around Christmas. So it loves the cool uh, temperatures. That's why they're typically grown outside. So if that kale you're talking about is after bolting, it either just needs a, a new lease of life, get in the young lads again, sow more, <laughs> get, sow more seeds and get them outside and don't put a clash on it. But you most certainly will need to put maybe a netting because of the cabbage white butterfly. These are only small things that I've learned myself after sowing lovely kale and other swedes and turnips and go, oh God, they're looking great now. Oh, can't wait to harvest these bad boys. Next thing, overnight, you literally go out there. Oh, look at them lovely butterflies. Next day again, caterpillars are eating every morsel of your kale and all the other brassicas that you have there have to be covered with a net throughout the summer months, the warmer months. Through the warmer months, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, most certainly is. And only uh, brassicas prefer the cold, don't they? That's yes, they bring out their sweetness. Yeah, they prefer the cold. And um, So broccoli, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and another, cover with a clash in the warmer months. And another B for the easy one for people to start off with, and they can look after it inside, say, oh, God, man, I don't have a pie, I don't have a glass house, is basil. Oh, basil, basil yeah. is brilliant. And literally sowing literally four seeds in a cup or a pot, leave it to germinate. Because more often than not, when we get the likes of the basil in those shops, uh, the large commercial stores, it is something that has about 10, 15 all in one and inevitably they all die. People say, Come on, I can't keep my basil alive. There's a couple of tips I highly recommend. So straight away is only pruning off or taking the leaves from the top because as a result of that, you encourage side shooting. So it's one of those things when people realise, go back to fourth class in school, what does a plant need to make food for itself? Leaves. And what do we do? Take all the lower leaves that so we're only left with this small little top of a basil leaf and left on the top it. and we choke it we clean it and then it can't make food for itself that's the first thing o buy a couple of different pots and literally only take the top two emerging leaves just encourage you tillering is the word on it so the tillering tillering I like that tillering that's yeah. nice so the next tillering thing tillering your basil tillering your basil next honey thing. would you mind tillering the basil tonight <laughs> but not too much not too much honey you know Coleman told us just yeah. the top two Good man. <laughs> so next thing is okay when you do get then buy them uh, basil from the shop you can really divide it out and making sure that you only have no more than five because it's in competition with a huge amount of root systems in that tiny little pot that you get it it literally is set for failure so and that's why they want you to go back again but if you sow them from seed I'm telling you the amount four to five seeds per your little yogurt tub that you can literally have from your um, I'm going to say recycling bin use that fill it with compost pull in the Little indent, thumb, first knuckle on your thumb, drop it in, four to five seeds, and then you're literally harvesting your own basil from your own seeds. And it's a no brainer. Pick a couple of different basil leaves, pop it in with your organic tomatoes you literally picked from your glass house, straight in the likes of your dish, dish bash bash. You're on a winner. Nice. Lovely Harlan. Yeah. Lovely Harlan. Dirty well, dozen, clean 15. Yes. You want to talk about these because, you know, for those who kind of can't afford organic and kind of can't necessarily grow their own. Or not convinced about it. Or not There's, convinced. What's the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15? So the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 is a list of foods that literally have been um, put out there for people to make better food choices are the ones that are most important to get organically. So the Clean 15 are the ones that are, are most certainly you can gain the advantage of obviously eating fruits or vegetables. But the point is the dirty dozen are the ones that you most certainly are heavily sprayed and most certainly more recommended to get. And just organically. A, organically. And the general rule is if you typically are going to have a fruit or a vegetable that the chemicals are applied to and we typically consume those, such as the likes of your apples, which can be sprayed for 10 times in a growing season, such as the likes of your fruits or berries, your Kale, strawberries, peaches. Yeah, it's all, the soft fruits. All the, the soft fruits, stuff. yeah, are listed on the dirty dozen because there are the areas that the chemicals are in every landed on. Grapes, yeah, all soft fruits, all uh, in every le leafy greens, and in on top of that, potatoes would also. And they're be the up ones there. that are best to consume organic. Yeah, most certainly, if you yeah. can, if you can afford. It. And then the dirty dozen are the ones that typically you can get away with, or the, the chemical residue is less likely to be as high. And they're the ones with the thicker skins, like avocados and mangoes and bananas, and bananas, ones, things that are coming a shell or yeah, yeah. And most people say, "Come on, I've actually changed up my diet a little bit. I'm eating organic bananas." That's not the most important one because again, you typically don't eat the skins of bananas, even though you can. Mm. Clean 15 So we got avocado. This is from Coleman's book The Power of Organic Fitness By um, by Coleman Power uh, Avocado, sweet Coleman corn Coleman J Power Oh Coleman J Power Sorry <laughs> Onions, J, papayas yeah. Not that we eat that many papayas Sweet peas, eggplant Also known as aubergine Asparagus, broccoli, cabbage Kiwi, cauliflower, mushroom Melon, 
uh, cantaloupe and honeydew. Nice. Yeah, interesting. And dirty dozen. So as we said, it's the soft fruits, strawberry, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, cherries, peaches, pears, peppers, celery, and tomatoes. That's the dirty yeah, dozen. Yes, so they're kind of high water based, like celery, cucumber. Yeah, mm, yeah really, yeah. really interesting. Okay, so so really, your philosophy in a nutshell is about like, and it it is a philosophy because your way of life is beautiful, and you are a wonderful fruit of your philosophy. Like you really are. It's about spending time outside. It's about being involved in growing your own food to some degree. And obviously, you are the great proponent of it. That you grow a lot of your own food. You know, as you've said to me before, from what I remember, is that in the summer you grow nearly all your food. You get nearly all your food, which is amazing. Um, and then it's moving, spending time outside, and moving, 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 moving your body because that's a piece we haven't talked about. Like, what's your fitness philosophy and your movement philosophy in terms of your mental health and your mindset? Absolutely massive. And I was just touching on this point with someone earlier is the point that whether you movement is key and whether you're my two year old niece or you're my 96 year old granny we all need to walk steps are so important steps in sunlight when you're getting outside it with the sunlight it improves your sleep it sets your circadian rhythm it tells your body to naturally wake up it tells your body to shut down in the evening most people are not getting enough sunlight and steps in that so when you get outside when you move more you literally start to feel more energetic because the sun without it we would all die nothing would grow we're so all solar powered we are we're all solar panels yeah that's exactly what we are mm. yeah so that would be the key thing for a movement and then on top of that you do more you get more I would highly recommend some form of resistant training. That isn't you going into the gym and thinking you're Arnold Schwarzenegger or the She-Hulk and lifting all these bars from down the floor all the way up, Olympic lifts over your head. No, it's two sets of dumbbells, minimum requirement, 20 minutes. After that, again, some people say, is it better to do cardio for either weight loss or health? The thing is, if you can do A and you can do B, well, most certainly do the likes of your weights and most certainly then your cardio after, whether it's a run, whether it's a high intensity on the spot, jumping jacks, high knees. It's all about just doing the exercise that you like, that you enjoy, that you will do long term. So I enjoy most certainly looking a certain way. I use dumbbells in for that reason. Home workouts uh, is what I currently use myself and would recommend to so many other different people. Two sets of dumbbells a floor space, a bottle of water, 20 minutes, knock it out in the morning, bish bash bosh, go straight into a healthy meal then, savoury organic porridge, nettles for breakfast. Uh, porridge with nettles, you're one of a kind <laughs> with that now. So, I, so is that what it is? No, porridge with seeds. nettles and peanut butter or what do you... What, what was it? So there, I, there was actually hemp seeds. So my breakfast this morning oh, was uh, hemp nice. seeds. That's another complete protein. Uh, very, uh, what, of the rare few that is a plant-based one that has all nine essential amino acids. I had that with the likes of four eggs, which again are nature's multivitamin, K, vitamin A, D, E and K. And uh, for people worried about their cholesterol, I'd be much more worried in their lack of movement before they consume maybe something that is free range local eggs from either a chicken, a duck, or actually very recently I got turkey eggs. Wow. wow, that's different. Different is right. Oh. Yeah. But porridge with nettles is gas. I must Lola used to have it with seaweed and avocado. Yeah, and I remember we had porridge in some Japanese restaurant one time. It was porridge, porridge with miso and yeah, it was different. weird. Well, it was weird given that it was like being Irish porridge. and we're used to sweet porridge. It was weird. Sweet but I'm sure you get used to it too. You know, the way. Nettles is a great one though. Like you're winning. Yeah, you know, I think nettle tea. I'd nettle like tea nettles supposedly they're great. Like, you know, each plant has different purposes uh, and nettles go down. They're in high nutrient dense soil. Uh, like, you know, fert um, fertile soil. Compost, like compost heaps, you'll find nettles growing a lot in that or waste ground where there is rich soil in it. And they go down and they tap up a lot of the nutrients and the minerals in the soil. So they're very dense in minerals. The stalk itself is super high in iron, used to be used for fibre, you know, for, for making clothes at one stage. I think the fibres of nettle were used to. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think one of the great, best sources of iron and calcium and all those type of things from what I remember. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. And again, it's free. free. It's at your back door. And as you touched on there, it's typically grown in manure, which is high nutrients. And that's where literally you're getting advantage of every vitamin and mineral comes from the soil. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and if you're not uh, crazy enough to try it in your porridge, you can simply just put it in boiling water, uh, uh, put it in, in a cup, add boiling water to it and stir it around and it turns, it goes bright green and it's it's like mainlining vitamin minerals. Like it really is. It's, it's, a bit, it's much thing. nicer in the porridge. Like I, I'd be all for drinking things like dandelion. There's, I wouldn't be like, oh yes, I love a cup of dandelion tea for the flavour. You put it into porridge, sprinkle pink Himalayan salt on it. It's just lovely to taste. 
Okay, I'll think you tomorrow. <laughs> think you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I'm still right. not convinced. No, 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 Metal maybe. porridge. <laughs> it feels like some kind of like, you know, slightly sadistic kind of uh, cold shower type therapy. But there's, again, there's major benefits to cold water exposure. Oh, and I know. That's, I, I, and that's the thing. No, People kind of really shove their nose up. Oh, nettles. Oh, cold shower. The sea. Oh, touching your hands off the soil. Come on, I'm not into any of that. But as soon as they do it, they go, oh my God, Coleman, I should have done this years ago. I'm so glad I came across to you. Thanks so much. And literally, they're so grateful that they did it. And it's about trying things that is different. Trying to grow your own. And literally, you'll see and taste the difference. Get outside and touch your feet off the soil. Get yourself an, into the best shape you can from doing more. Steps, walks, workouts, sea swims, movement, foods. You can't beat it. Yeah. Mighty, mighty. Uh, okay. Uh, no, one thing I'd love to. Sorry. Yeah. No. Go on. Okay. Go on away. Go. Community, because for anyone who's trying to live possibly a healthy life, one of the most sustainable parts is friendship and people that live a similar life to you. Because we all want to be part of a tribe, and ultimately, if you want to live a healthy life, the easiest thing you can do is to have healthy friends. I wonder if you could talk about community. Definitely. And yeah. how important that is for you for not only sustaining your health but the community of your soil too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Massively, and what I'm trying to do as one individual is actually build a community of people. So I mentioned that when I started off, there would have been no one really going towards growing their own. I would have got called granddad, and that's something that I kind of had to take on the chin and kind of go, yeah, well, now I'm the granddad, and people are going to go, oh, yeah, it's kind of cool now the Coleman's doing it. But it wasn't at the start. It definitely wasn't cool. But what you do is I had to incorporate in building a couple of friends that were interested in that. And now more and more people want to do it. And the idea that as of two years ago, I do events such as like retreats down in Cork and people come and do all these activities. First thing in the morning, they're doing grounding. Then they're doing the yoga. Then we go down and do the sea swimming. Your breakfast is cooked by a nutritionist. We come back up and it's lovely. It's all handed out up um, in front of you. You then have a chance to, an opportunity to go out with me to a polytunnel, to a glass house and a raised bed where we literally so, show people how easy it is to sow a courgette seed. It's absolutely massive. It's a pumpkin seed. That's, they're in the same family. Big as your thumbnail. Put it in the ground. It comes up once you do give it a little bit of water. And, and after that then, in, you literally harvest your fruits, bring it back in. There's nothing more enjoyable. And when people kind of come together and do that and build that friendship of coming together at a certain time it makes it much more easier because if you try to do things on your own the quote that comes to mind if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far go together so, so, so you do do retreats and you do growing courses don't you there's courses to grow in yeah. your vet trying to teach people because that's your mission really is to try to empower others to to, to follow suit and, and get the gift which you have you know the gift which you've got from growing produce really yeah, and that is that is my mission, to get as many people to grow their own foods so that they can be as self-sufficient as they would like whatever area they're growing in, whether it's in a pot, whether it's in a raised bed. You can grow so much more in the likes of a glass house or a python. It doesn't even have to be that big. You could literally, a metre squared, which is literally one yard, one step, one step, one step, you can be self-sufficient in greens. Like that's your kale, that's your spinach, perpetual spinach, then growing in the different... Rocket. Rocket, yeah, no-brainer. I mean, Suna, Mustard tastoid. greens are... Yeah. Mazuna is one of my favourite. I like, love Mazuna. Like it really is one that, that is not common, but it's... It, it looks like rocket, so it's got like spiky little edges on it. It's an Asian green, and you think it's going to have a gnarly taste, but it tastes fresh, and it tastes moist, and it's juicy. very hard to describe. It's juicy, and it's not like it's just a beautiful. Mine is mustard green. I mustard love mustard green. greens because you, you like hand some spice. Well, you and hand some of like what they think is this crappy kind of green, and they kind of like I'm not into lettuce, and they eat it, and they go, whoa! Like it's just it's bracing. Like it has that strong mustard note. And like it has that mustard, almost like a horseradish or a radishy like mustard, where it's like back of the throat, peppery type. Yeah, you know. we, we wouldn't have grown up with that. I, I don't no, know. No. Yeah, I, I just, just remember butterhead lettuce. Like when mom was making salad, it was butterhead lettuce with a cucumber, a few tomatoes, and if it was a winter day, there might have been a scallion or two in there. But that Ooh, was that day. was salad, like butterhead lettuce. Yeah, and that's com that's a million miles away from that mensuna or mm -hmm. tatsoi is another one that oh, you know, it's that. another Asian green. It's small little baby like pak choy. Baby, baby pak choy. That's a great example of what it is. And the flavour again. As soon as you get people to taste, they go, "Oh yeah, now I kind of like lettuce." Because butterhead, lo and behold, it is something that comes into season throughout the summer months because it tolerates a lot of the heat. But when you eat an Asian green, the flavour is just an uncomparable. Mm. Wow, this is like a food podcast today. Like the bit that's lit us up most has been the food. 
the disgust yeah. in the food, yeah, which totally. is gas. And, and I'd love to go up to the farm now and actually uh, have a look around. So um, I, I'm going to wrap this up by saying, Coleman Power, you're an inspiration. You genuinely are. For anyone who's listening, do check him out. He's on social media. He's prolific. He's a very inspiring Coleman man. Coleman no E. Oh, yeah, yes. Coleman with no E. He's on Instagram. He's on all the social media platforms. Uh, organic Fitness, Coleman Power. And, uh, His book is The Power of Organic Fitness. Yeah, and, and like as he said, it's all about inspiring people to eat more fruit and veg and empowering you to grow your own veg and move more. Really positive message. Does retreats and does growing courses if you're based in Ireland. And uh, just a, a, a wonderful human. Great role model. So yeah, it's been a real pleasure having you here with us today, Coleman. Thanks for having me on. Dream. Yeah. So man. <laughs> 